much. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one through verse 13. You don't have to stand, just reverence in your hearing, okay? Because when we stand up, things start happening and we start running around. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves. They'll make their own teachers have an itching ears. For them kind, don't go on their Facebook lives. Turn away. Turn your ears away from, they'll turn away your ears from the truth. And shall be turned unto what? Fables. But watch thou in all things. You got to go through some things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For as for me, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Finish my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not just to me, but unto all them also that does what? Love his appearing. Do your diligence to come short. I do my diligence. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus when thou comest. Bring it with you in the books, but especially the parchments. I'm going to speak to you for a moment, just for a few moments. Coats and books. Coats and books. Um, you know, the, the ministry of Apostle Paul is so impactful that we easily quote as preachers more from Apostle Paul than we do Jesus, right? Because most of the New Testament is either penned by his hand or someone uh, wrote it for him. And oftentimes it was from an obscure location, like imprisonment. Just a few points and I'll go to the ordination. When we know the ministry of Apostle Paul, we see the beginning of it. Uh, he was very zealous in the wrong direction. He was such a student of the Torah and had such a passion for truth that he felt it was his assignment to destroy these new believers. You know, you have to realize the apostles were not trying to start another religion. They believed that Yeshua HaMashiach was the fulfillment of what had already been declared under the old covenant. Hmm. But Apostle Paul studying under Gamaliel and those of the doctors of the law uh, had such a fervent passion um, that in his passion he tried to kill what God had ordained to save him. Mm -hmm. How many of us have experienced to where God has given us an assignment to help somebody where at the same time you've had to dodge their threats. Mm. I need you to look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I'm not going to beg you and bless you. It's just where I am right now. I'm not begging you to stay in my church. I'm not begging you to come. I'm no longer begging you to do what you already said God called you to do. But I digress. 
Apostle Paul is on the road to Damascus, right? To persecute believers. And then, of course, God speaks to him. Supernatural experience. God speaks to him and said, you know, Saul, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you? He said, I am Christ. Um, we were talking earlier this week about what was our calling like? And I think it's very important that we be clear with you in this room that as a believer, you all have the ability to hear from God. As a matter of fact, it's important that you hear from God for yourself. But how do you learn to hear? The Bible says, how can you hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they be sent? We learn the voice of God by hearing the voice of our leaders. Now, before you think that's cultish or some sort of erroneous doctrine, the Bible says that when God called Samuel, my Lord, Samuel went to Eli. God said, Samuel. And he went to Eli and said, yes, sir. Now, you have to realize Samuel has been in the house with Eli since he was a small child. So he knows the voice of Eli. So how is it that when God called Samuel, he went to Eli? Because he learned hearing God from the voice of his leader. To the point when God spoke to him, it sounded like his pastor. And let me tell you something. I wouldn't be under anybody in this hour that I am not convinced that they speak for God. I'm not staying in a church out of family obligation. I'm not staying nowhere just because they give me a check or an opportunity. At the end of the day, I don't need my pastor to be my best friend. They ain't never got to bring me to their house. I ain't never got to sit at a table and eat with them. I'm not coming after them for personality. I need the word. I need to hear from God. Because Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20 says, If you believe God, you'll be established. But if you believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Look at somebody tell them prosperity is in the mouth of my prophet. My God, I didn't say in the mouth of a pimp, somebody who doing it, hallelujah, just to do it. I'm talking about somebody who's been called, hallelujah, somebody who has the wingspan to cover me. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. He was familiar with the written Torah. So when the Torah personified or the embodiment of the Torah spoke out of the cloud to him, he had a reference point. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And I'm coming to declare to some of you that there are some things we felt in this atmosphere this week. There are some things that made us quicken. There are some things we jumped up and danced about without all the information connected to it. Have you ever had a witness in, oh, I'm almost finished. Have you ever had a witness in your spirit without any information in your head? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says we pray in the Holy Ghost, right? We do all this praying in tongues. But the truth is, Paul says, when I pray in tongues, my understanding is unfruitful. But what I do know, although I don't know what I'm saying, I know the will of God is being declared. And I'm just going to stop right here to tell some of you in this room, round about Wednesday of next week, you're getting ready to find out what the praise was really about. Round about Wednesday of next week, I come to tell somebody that we're about to flood our social media platforms, not talking about our haters, but talking about what God did. I need you to scream at somebody in your section, tell them I'm coming back with the evidence. I won't jump in just to be jumping. I felt something in my spirit, although I didn't have a whole lot of information in my head. But the Bible declares, eyes have not seen, neither ears heard, nor have it entered the heart of man what God has in store. But it is revealed by his spirit. I need you to push somebody, tell them the Holy Ghost is about to reveal it. You're about to find out why the devil fought you so hard from trying to get the convocation. You get ready to try to find out why the warfare was so intense in this last season because something is about to turn. I need about a hundred people to open up your mouth by faith and praise God for the part you don't understand. Praise
Praise God for the part that don't make sense. Praise God for the part that makes you scratch your head. He gonna make sense out of it. And so God speaks to him. Paul has a conversion, a God experience. Because God speaks to us through people. God speaks to us supernaturally. But don't, don't always feel like if you didn't ever have a voice come out of the cloud that God is not speaking. Oftentimes when I tell you that God told me to tell you something, well, first of all, can we stop for a moment? Let us, uh, let us sanitize that statement again. Can we do that, pastors? Elders, bishops, can we sanitize the statement God told me to tell you? Can we do that? If you need the people to clap their hands, just ask them to clap their hands. Don't say, God told me to tell you to clap your hands. If you need to receive an offering, just ask for the money. Don't tell me God told me to tell you if God didn't tell you. Can we sanitize that statement? Because after a while, we have cheapened the prophetic. Because people no longer believe it because of all of our conjured up colloquial phrases. And Let's sanitize God told me. But oftentimes, when I do tell you God told me, or sometimes if I'm not sure, I says I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my spirit. It's because oftentimes when I tell you that, I'm not hearing a voice out of the cloud like Paul did. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of me. And so it's an inward voice. And that's why we have to protect the ear gates of our leaders. If you're an armor bearer or a first lady, don't put everything in the ear of your pastor before Sunday morning. Guard the door. If, if there's no toilet paper in the bathroom, go get some. Guard the door. If you're not coming to church and you've been knowing for the last two months that y'all gonna be on vacation, don't call them on Sunday morning. I got to because it's through this satellite, it's through this mechanism that God speaks to us. And because God speaks to us here, the only, I, 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 there's a complication with it because not only am I hearing God, but I got to differentiate between the voice of God, the voice of the enemy, and my flesh. Because my flesh and the enemy is not the same thing. Sometimes we rebuke and the is not the same thing. Devil, well, we just need to rebuke ourselves. Come on, somebody. If you're insecure, don't bring your insecurity to praise and worship. Hey, come on, somebody. If, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, have a, if you have low self-esteem, don't bring that to the platform and need to stimulate the crowd just to affirm you. And if they don't clap for you, then you get mad and you lay them out and says, oh, I'm not your favorite preacher. No, you're not your favorite preacher. You're not, your, you're not convinced that you've been called. Because when you're convinced you've been called, you can preach when there's a crowd and you can preach when there's five people. When you're convinced you've been called, when the people clap, you can stand. And when they don't clap, you can still stand. And so, y'all be seated. I already went past. I told them I was going to preach 10 minutes. Um, so you need to be open to hear from God. And the way you make the separation... The way you amplify the voice of God in your thought pattern is according to Romans chapter uh, 12, verse number one. If you really want to amplify the voice of God, that's why you got to know when to pull from Netflix and social media. Because anytime the voice of God and the voice of the enemy and your own flesh is competing on the same frequency, you need the voice of God amplified in your life. And Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, this is how you do that. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, holy and acceptable unto God, which you should be doing anyway. 
Then it says, learn sanctification. Be not conformed to this world. Oh, we don't preach this. This ain't a conference message. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove. You can prove what God is saying. You will know for clear what God is saying. Because sometimes it's not enough just to read the scriptures. Scriptures and the word is not the same thing. Because there's some people who know the scriptures, but they don't know the word. Paul knew the scriptures and he didn't know the word. Scriptures are the letters on the page, but the word of the scriptures illuminated. So if you just got a scripture, you can take any scripture just to have an excuse to do what you want to do. Because there's one scripture says drive and go forth, and there's another scripture says be still and know that I am God. But when the spirit, what God illuminates, glory be to tell your neighbor, I got a word. So then y'all be seated real quick. So what happened is he, ex he experienced a supernatural conversion, but then the instructions, he didn't just go straight to preaching. And I think we need to have that conversation because some people frown upon ordination ceremonies. And they will say, well, I don't need man's paper. God called me. I don't need a paper from a man. Okay, I get what you're saying. The only challenge with this is, if you're sick, you're gonna go to a doctor. And you don't want a doctor that just been called to be a doctor. Somebody who just got an aspiration to be a doctor. I want somebody that got man's paper because you're being a doctor means you are affecting somebody's health. If you find yourself in a tight situation where you got to go to court, you need a lawyer. But you don't want nobody who practicing in their head and at home but ain't never been to law school. You want them to have, you want to make sure they got documentation, man's paper, because somebody as a lawyer affects an uh, uh, individual's freedom. Well, how much more should we need man's paper who's affecting people's souls? Apostle Paul, the one we always acknowledge is this great apostle, this apostle to the Gentiles, wrote most of the New Testament. Even after he had a supernatural experience, he had to follow the instructions. And the instructions were, go to the house of Ananias. Go sit at somebody's feet. <sighs> Tell your neighbor before you stand on your own feet. You got to sit at somebody else's feet. I've been trying to get to point one, so I got to just wrap it up now. Point one is the call does not eliminate the process. Just because you're called, called does not mean you don't have to be processed. Oftentimes the call is to the process. You know you're pregnant, you just don't know what you're carrying. And many of us have mislabeled what we're carrying because we've tried to put a label on our ministry based upon what we saw other people do. Just because you're anointed does not mean you're ready. Uh, Ashley, will you put, uh, I have a prayer picture where I'm getting prayed for as a kid. Will you put that on the screen if you have it? If you have it. called now some of you this picture will be a little foreign for you maybe it's a cultural thing for you uh, that you don't understand this photo but I grew up in a church where if you wanted to be saved they didn't have you to repeat after them there was no such a thing in that day as a sinner's prayer I still ain't found it in the scripture, but I'm not trying to fight nobody. They used to tell us, them that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they took it literal. It's what we call tarry service. Now, 
we uh, we misdefined or uh, the word Terry. We found out that the word Terry means to wait. But the older I get, the more I realize that although the older generation was missing some things educationally, the more I unpack it, they had a spiritual revelation. Oh, glory be to God. This tarry that means for us wait, they said, no, tarry ain't sitting around. What did they do in the upper room? They start preparing themselves. If you go to a restaurant and you get a waiter, you're going to get an attitude if that waiter comes in at the table and sit down. You got to prepare for the meal. So they used to say, if you want the Holy Ghost, you got to prepare your vessel for it. If you notice in this picture, my hand is not closed with the symbol of prayer. They would say, call on Jesus and clap your hands. Mm. They would say, call on Jesus and clap your hands. See, clapping hands in Eastern culture is a symbol of summonsing outside help. And Jesus says, I won't leave you helpless. Who shall I? But I'll send another car. Hey, glory be to God. And so when you need help to do something you've been called to do, but you don't have the strip to do it, Jesus. Bartimaeus says, I'm blind and I need healing. Jesus. Peter said, I'm drowning and I need rescuing. Jesus. <laughs> the name all right what was the what was the point of going to Ananias for development and discipleship and so this is my prayer I want every elder and deacon and pastor lift your hands Lord grace us for discipleship Grace us for discipleship. This is why we need to realize, you can take your hands down. We've got to be willing to do life with people. No, really. Because we get people and we, look to, we teach them how to church, but not how to walk with God, how to live life. We, we, need, we need to develop, we need development, and we need discipleship. And this is the challenge. Ananias is called to disciple someone that he doesn't desire to disciple. You know why? Because Paul is complicated. He's complicated. Disciple him? If, if people see him coming in my house, I don't want to be associated. And I want to lift to you all, everybody wants to pastor John but no one really wants And I know y'all want to celebrate Peter and throw down Judas, but they're very similar. One just recovered. You know, Peter can be your greatest strength and a great distraction. Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor, ask him, are you anointed? to disciple complicated people. See, if, if we even look, we're so non-evangelistic that our flyers are catered to church people. How are you having an evangelistic service on Friday night that says, come on, we about to have a high time in God and go to another dimension? What does that mean? That's not for the saints. That's you trying to get members from somebody else's church. And that's why you had it on a Friday night. You keep on pulling in people based upon their gifts and their church resume. You have somebody in your house that will always make you wonder do they belong to you. But if God ever convert one, that came from the street. If God ever get a hold of one that was an atheist, they'll fight for you while everybody else sleep on you. You, if you, they're complicated.
excited. They cuss sometimes. Y'all not saying nothing to me. They still shacking and still going back sometimes. Sometimes you got to get them out of the crack house and then turn around and get them back to get them back for church on Sunday. But if they ever get converted, they're coming to covenant with you. And when everybody else is discussing you as a leader, they say, take your mouth off my pastor. Don't you talk about my pastor. Because my pastor knew my business, knew what I did, and still covered me. I need to know, do I got any Peters in here? I, Bishop, I'm sorry. I gave you some problems. Pastor, I'm sorry that I was complicated. But at the end of the day, Pastor, I'm too much of a Peter to ever be a Judas. I'm serious. No, no, no. I'm serious. I don't care what you think you heard. I got a, I got a sword in my hand. Development and discipleship. Apostle Paul, it's complicated for you because you're not called to fit in. You're called to be a part. You have to realize, because of his background, he's, he's too much of a Jew that, the, that these new vein of people of the way don't know whether they can trust him. But he got too much of a revelation of Yeshua that those of Judaism can't embrace him anymore. I mean... I love God, but maybe not as churchy as somebody else. But I can't hang out with my friends that's drinking and smoking weed either. I mean, I tried, and then I tried to convince them that I'm really, I mean, no, ain't nothing changed. When the truth is, everything has changed. Tell your neighbor, you don't have to fit in, but you do have to be a part. Don't use your uniqueness as an excuse to be isolated. Remember, you are never anointed for yourself. You are anointed for someone else. You know, when I was growing up in church, David says, on the road to Damascus, he, he came down the road as Saul, and then God changed his name to Paul. I like that, you know, I do. <laughs> but I don't think that's really what happened because God calls him Saul, Saul, right? In some places he's called Paul, in some places he's called Saul. Paul was his Roman name. Roman citizenship, but Hebrew identity doesn't have to be in conflict. Tell your neighbor, all of it is you. No, no. I am made in the image of God. The trichotomy of God, of his being, triune in his manifestation, one in essence. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And whatever was ever needed, he became what he needed. To the point, if the foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, that declares he's one, not just numerically, but he's one Shaddai, self-sufficient one sits on the council of his own will. I am God and beside me, come on, we're not dancing dummies over here, come on. And beside me there is another, and beside me there is no savior. Well, where, 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 where did the sonship come in? Where the Bible said in Isaiah uh, chapter nine, his name shall be called. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is a son is given. So if beside him there is no savior, where was the sonship? Where was Jesus? Well, we're not Arianists. We don't believe that Jesus had a beginning because Jesus is the beginning. Hallelujah. Hey, glory be to God. I want you to know the sonship had a birthing. Hallelujah. But Yeshua was always was and always will be. 
my God. So when he needed a savior, my God, God became the son of himself to redeem man back unto himself. How? He says, I am God. Beside me, there is no other. Greatest the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. I wish I had a church over here. Preaching to the Gentiles. Seen of angels. Justified in the spirit. Tell somebody only one God. One God. One God. It don't take three gods to be one devil. Hey, one God. Father in creation. Son of the Holy Ghost in this church. Now y'all, y'all know I don't preach like this on the road, but this is our national, international church. You don't have to divorce all that you are in order to be used by God. Where there is a need, God has already supplied it in you. I wanna say to our preachers and to our deacons, you are anointed the way you are all that you are operate in the way god has given it to you don't mimic our style don't feel like you have to mimic our style to walk in our anointing it don't have to be loud to be god come on somebody you are anointed and your style is anointed but your style is not synonymous with the anointing and if you are limited to only one style that's going to limit the audience that you can minister to what happens when God calls you to an arena where there's no touch your neighbor can you preach Jesus can you preach Jesus without a ham and organ? Can you preach Jesus without your amen crowd? Mm, all right. So Apostle Paul is coming to the end of his ministry. I'm just going to expedite now. Thank you all for your patience. He comes down to the end of his ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hallelujah. I want you to put that picture. I'm at, I'm, I'm, put that picture on the screen when I was a, on a bunk bed. Will you do that? So that's Brad, Delisa, and that's Bruce way down under the bottom. And is that Kelly? All right. Now go to the next picture. This is me now. Y'all usually never see me in a pair of shorts, all right? Because the Bible said for the neckiness of. Okay, now I'm not going to do that. All right. <laughs> I mean, the saints told me that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell you where I am in this picture. This is me seven years ago going to Brazil, and we didn't have money for hotel rooms. God told us to go to Brazil. And so there was a couple that was kind enough to let us use their living room. And we bought some cheap bunk beds they moved out their sofa to the neighbor's house and let us put bump beds in their living room. I'm actually on the phone with Ruach Radio in London. So I'm in Brazil sleeping on the bottom bunk with my saints and on the phone talking to a radio station in London. Yes, we're in Brazil doing ministry. I should have said from the second bunk. <laughs> All the times when we talk about having faith, it's like, Lord, here's my faith. Now give me what I want. Here's my faith. Give me the building. Here's my faith. Heal my body. Here's my faith. Give me a job. Here's my faith. Give me a spouse. But ancient faith is here's my faith. 
sustain me in what you want. Here's my faith. Help me to endure suffering. Here's my faith. Keep me alive in the process. Here's my Seven years ago, hallelujah, didn't have money to go out to eat. So we put our money together and bought groceries. Hallelujah. And y'all know, Lazaletos de Scupa, breakfast in Brazil is different than breakfast in the United States. They eating a whole lot of bread and sandwiches, cheese, and then for lunch, cheese and for dinner, cheese. I'm just kidding. El Chiamo Blasileros. And so, oh, coffee. Oh my goodness. Muito bom, coffee. Obrigado. Thank you. But all of it was different. Do you have faith to sustain you in the process when what's in front of you looks nothing like what God showed you? And what you have to do, Apostle Paul, is you're on this journey being shipwrecked and going from challenge to challenge. You can't get overwhelmed or even distracted by the future. Be fueled by the future, but don't be distracted by it. Oh, let me close it out there. I said, don't be fueled by it because you know what God showed you, but don't be distracted by it because oftentimes we don't go through certain doors because it don't look like the room. We wanted to go in. Be careful how you handle people who you think don't matter. Stop walking up to pastors and shaking their hand and stepping over their wives and stepping over their armor bearers. Oh, y'all not saying that. Don't you make him a plate if you can't make her a plate. Y'all not. Be careful how you handle the ushers at the door and the greeters at the door. Be careful how you handle maids at the hotel. Be careful how you handle waitresses and waiters with your church clothes on and all of your vestments. Because you don't know who God is going to use. It was a damsel that told Naaman that there's a prophet in Israel. It was a damsel. It was a maid servant who had the connection to Naaman's healing. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, be careful how you handle me. You don't know what I'm carrying. You don't know. You don't know. Be careful. All right. Uh, Asher, put the picture up now on the screen of Ramp San Paulo. That's how it started. Now, this is how it's going. Hey, glory be to God. Hallelujah. It was, uh, I'm praying about who's going to be our leader in San Paulo. We sitting in the car in the middle of the night me and Hebridge and Gabby praying about who is God going to call to lead our ramp church in Brazil. We praying and we fasting and we can't find nobody. No, no name settles right with us. Nothing, because it needs to be a God connection. Because I believe if you walk people in slow, you won't have to run them out fast. Lay hands on no man suddenly. Anybody that come to your church must be willing to go through the process, even if they've already endured the process somewhere else. Credentials do not transfer. Know them that labor among you. Be willing to start back at the beginning if your heart is really pure. Hebridge, come to convocation to help translate. He's an IT specialist in his country. He does well with IT. I said, I need you to come and do translation. He's a sound man in church. That's his ministry. I said, come do translation. Yes, Bishop. And we're standing on this stage in a convocation several years ago. And the Holy Ghost was moving in the service. And Heberts was standing in the back. And I looked at him. I said, come here. 
And he walked up a very conservative young man. Herbert's never run to the front and dance with the rest of us. Very conservative German Brazilian. An IT specialist. So they alinear, they real technical, not real emotional. And I said, come up here. And I didn't know what God was going to say because God don't always tell us. Sometimes you don't prophesy in third person. Sometimes you got to prophesy in first person. And all you can do is open up your mouth and the word will come forth. And I grabbed him by the hand. And God spoke to me and said, this is my choice. While I'm holding his hand, missionary Jedaliah, not, on, not knowing, come here missionary Jedaliah, not knowing what I said to him. She, come here, come here Gabby. She walked over, glory be to God. She walked over to Herbert's wife and says, Gabby, today you just became a pastor's wife. I come to tell somebody in this room, somebody is waiting on you. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, get out of your feelings. Come on, tell them, move out of your fear. Somebody is waiting on you. Somebody's destiny is connected to your obedience. Somebody's future is leaning on your surrender. Get out of your seat and run to three people. Tell them, somebody is waiting on you. Stop focusing on the rejection. Stop focusing on who left your church there's somebody who's waiting on you if you preach with the cloak of despair they won't recognize you if you minister under bitterness they won't know the voice but somebody all right I'll, I'll close with this I'll close with this somebody is Somebody, somebody is waiting on you. Somebody. I, I close with this. Hi, Ma. Because of the pandemic, I had not been to our churches in India in almost three years. In almost three years. And there was a situation that was impending looming over one of our churches in India. It was the fact that the bishop's son wanted to choose his own wife. And that's a little foreign for Western culture. But in Eastern culture, you don't marry for your desire. You marry for the family. That even your marriage is not about you. One time, some years before, I had debated with Pastor Elisha Samavetam. And I said, this arranged marriage is, is Indian culture. And he looked at me and says, is it Indian or is it Bible? He says, when God used Abraham and Abraham sent Eleazar to go find a wife for Isaac, was that India? He says, you can't tell me. Your country has nursing homes. You can't tell me. So I knew that with this situation, I had to handle it with hypersensitivity. So they were waiting on me to come make the decision whether their son would marry who he wanted to. And they suspended it the decision for me to get there. Wow. Wow. Mm. Oh my goodness. So going to India this last time, it came with a great responsibility. I'm praying, I'm travailing, I'm interceding because whatever happens in the bishop's church is going to send a message through all of the churches. Whatever happens in the bishop's church. See, I want you to know, when God elevates your leader, everything in the house got to be elevated. You can't be an overseer and then your people don't support convocation. You can't be a bishop and the report shows that you haven't paid your credentials. Elder who? Take off some of these ropes if you're not supporting with your flesh and your finances. 
There's a, there is a responsibility that comes with promotion. And so then, I then say, okay, we got to make this decision. We're going to get through this. But while I'm there, this pastor says, I need you to speak at the pastor's conference. Hallelujah. And we were planning for this pastor's conference, but as we got close to the pastor's conference, something happened at his church building, and he had to use another church at the last minute, a pastor that he didn't even know. We went there, and the room was full. All the pastors were on one side, and all the pastor's wives on the other side. I'm trying to prepare the day before for this pastor's conference. I'm trying to get all my theology to show a balance of approach of theological teachings. But we needed to take a break and some of the people wanted to go to the jewelry store thinking because our currency has a little bit more weight than the Indian rupee that we would get jewelry very cheap. And they said, come on, go with us. I said, no. Nah. I said, you know what? I do want a bracelet. I want a bracelet from India that will commemorate me going. I want to be able to say that came from India, right? But when I went in the jewelry store, I realized that although our money goes far, the goal was being weighed. And so the price of the bracelets were too expensive for me. I had the money, but I didn't have the money for that. That's a difference. I hope y'all get that revelation. So, Sister Selena and them, they went around and got ear bar, I mean earrings. Elder Vance, she went and got a whole bunch of bracelets. Y'all know our sisters love to adorn themselves in costly array. Thank you, Apostle Paul. And so, we were walking out and they says, Bishop, you're not going to get that bracelet? I was like, nah, I, I just can't, I can't see myself doing missions and then spending that kind of money on one bracelet. I could take that money and take care of a whole village, so I'm not going to do it. We went to the, the pastor's conference the next day, all the men sitting on one side, all the women sitting on another side, and all of a sudden, one woman! came running through the back door and came on the front row and sat beside her husband and looked at me like this. And looked at her husband and said, and I was like, yes, I am the prophet. He is me. And all of a sudden, we had a great time. God moved in a mighty way. And after it was over, we come to find out that couple that was sitting on the front row, they were the pastors of that church. They said, will you please come downstairs to our home? I said, sure. I came in. It was a big, long table. They laying out food, and I'm saying, I'm not going to eat. They're trying to bring us to eat. We can't eat because we've experienced another warfare. And And we can't eat. So they said, no, no. I said, they brought me down a hallway, and Sister Tanise was with me, Elder Vance, and Joshua Alatus. They brought us down a hallway, and then they said, it was their bedroom. Now I'm like, this big living room and this big kitchen. They, I said, oh, no, no, it's okay. That's, no, no, please, please, please. Then they came in, and then they said, sit right here on the bed. And y'all know it. I'm like, in our country, <laughs> even before COVID, my mama didn't let me sit on her bed. Not with your outside clothes. <laughs> I'm sit on my bed. I used to wait for my mama to go to work just so I could sneak in her bed to see what was magical about it. They said, no, 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 no. Sit here at the edge of the bed. So I was like, I don't want to be, you know, offensive. So I sit at the edge of the bed. And while I'm sitting at the edge of the bed, Dr. Parker, the wife said, I already saw this. She said, I woke up one morning and God told me he was going to give us a witness. She says, I didn't see nobody's face. But I saw a man sitting at the edge of our bed. My husband said, I didn't see anybody. She said, I saw it in my dream. There's a man sitting at the edge of my bed. And said, and in the dream, she said, God told me to do something. 
She says, this piece of jewelry has been in a safe deposit box at the bank for over a year. Two weeks ago, God told me to go get it. When I walked in the room and saw you, that's when I told my husband, it's him. Put that picture on the screen. Right there at the edge of their bed. Hallelujah. That bracelet right here on my left arm was the bracelet that she went and got off the safety deposit box. I come to tell you, every leader, God is about to send people into your life. Hallelujah. Whatever sacrifices you made on this last journey, God is about to send people into your life that's going to make up for the hurt, that's going to make up for the inconvenience. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, what you did for them is not against you. You helped one person, but God is going to use somebody else to help you you was hurt by one person but God is going to use somebody else to heal you somebody is looking for you somebody you are going to be the answer to somebody's prayer this ordination is not about you you being a pastor it's not about you he says he looked on them and he had compassion for they were like a sheep without a shepherd so God said I'll give you pastors not out of my foot I'll give you pastors not out of my head but I'll give you pastors right out of my heart you want to open up your mouth because the Bible said he got up leaving captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and he gave some he gave them apostles he gave others he gave them prophets he gave others he gave them evangelists pastors and teachers for the building up for the edifying of the body and for the perfection of the saints clap your hands and give God praise clap your hands Paul said, I don't know how long I have because none of us do. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I have no idea concerning my expiration date. I don't. He said, he said, but what I do feel, I feel like my departure, my departure is at hand. My departure is at hand. Because I didn't fought the fight, good fight. I've kept the faith. Because your fight is really the fight of faith. Just lean over on somebody and tell them, you got to fight to believe. When everything Deacon Fuller seemed like it's working against you. When it seemed like it's getting worse than getting better. It makes you question did God really call you? You have to fight to believe. He told them about the crown. But then Elder Brittany, he said, my departure is at hand. But oh, uh, if y'all go by Carpus's house before you come, get my coat. Get my books. Especially my parchment. Today's message is coats and books. As we lay hands on you today, we are laying hands on you to suffer to die and that you may count God worthy of it. No matter what prophets come into your life and speak glamour, nations, platforms and pulpits, it will not come without persecution. Those before you suffered you will also suffer but my prayer is 
that even when you suffer you'll have your coat may you forever feel covered by those who are in this room even by the prayers of those who are not alive to stand by you today may you forever feel covered by those who imparted in you and never got a chance to see you walk in the fulfillment of it may you forever feel covered for David prayed the prayer Lord cover me in the day of battle he didn't say Lord fix it that I don't go in the battle but cover me may you feel covered under his wings and even in your worst days when friends are at a distance or you're in a room full of people and still feel by yourself may you hold on to the book especially the parchments it's one thing to have the book but the parchments it's Paul's notes what he saw in it what God did the journaling of his own experience when days come and they will that make you wonder did you hear what you heard may you open up the parchments and rehearse the story may you forever hold on to your coat and your book God bless you Hey, this is Bishop S.Y. Younger. Thank you for watching this video. And now what I need you to do is like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can continue to get more inspirational, motivational, and gospel content in your direction.